Hello and welcome. Security and safety is the primary concern for the millions of refugees fleeing the brutal fighting in Darfur. Sudan's recent acceptance of a hybrid United Nations African Union peacekeeping force for Darfur may help calm some of the ethnic and political tensions there, but beyond the conflict is the long-term concern for food and water, which is often in short supply. One Egyptian scientist, a veteran of NASA, believes he has found an answer in the form of what's being called an ancient mega lake. If successfully drilled, this underground water supply may provide some relief for those suffering in Sudan. A key obstacle is the skepticism many scientists are expressing about this project. On today's show, we talk to the scientists behind the discovery and ask, how do you get water out of the desert? And don't forget, we take your questions via phone and mobile text on the show, and the numbers are there on your screen. And joining me now is Dr. Farouk Elbaz, the founder and director of Boston University's Remote Sensing Center. His team's discovery of the ancient lake bed in Darfur spurred the launch of the 1,000 Wells for Darfur initiative. Dr. Obaz, good to speak with you. Thank you, good to see you. It's good to speak to you again, I should say. Thank actually. you, yes, <laughs> indeed. I've got to start by asking you, you describe it as an ancient mega lake. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, ancient because it is old. It means that there is no water in the lake now. The water was there and dried up many thousands of years ago. Mega lake because, mega meaning large. It's huge, Because it? it is huge, it is as big as the state of Massachusetts, or is as big as Lake Erie in, uh, in North America. So it is a vast area that had water in it for a very long period of time, but it is now totally dry, covered by sand. You do not see a hint of water. So uh, the way you're describing it, it doesn't sound like there's much potential for it. No, when you look at it, you don't think that there would be any water down here. We, you have sand and you have salt and you have a miserable territory that is hot and dry and windy and uh, you don't want to go there. However, wherever you have in the desert areas, where the, where the, wherever you have a depression where water stood there for a while, some of that water evaporates naturally, but some of it seeps under, uh, under the, uh, the uh, lake site and uh, concent be concentrated as groundwater in the porous sandstone beneath. Okay, now how did you discover this? It's really uh, applying three types of satellite images. First, you have the pictures from Landsat that shows you the outside of the, of the, of the land. So you can map where the rocks are and where the sands are, where the soils are. Then there is a uh, radar instrument that actually penetrates through the sand cover and reveals the underlying topography. And this is where we began to see the courses of ancient rivers. Then we have uh, something called the radar topography, which actually gives us the elevations in, in by exact numbers of the elevations of the different features. So when you put all of these things, the view from the surface, the view under the sand, and the topography, you, you get a, a complete three-dimensional view of the way the land was. Now, presumably, you just drill to get the water? Is that how? Is it as easy as that? Yes, when you have uh, conditions like that, and we've tried that in several areas in uh, regional, regionally. In, uh, we tried that in Egypt, and we tried that in Oman, where you have an area where uh, you had a possibility for water staying there for a long while, meaning a, a lake that where water existed for thousands of years, which is the case, then you know that some of that water has got to be there. So, and the only way to know, number one, whether there is water down there or not, mm. number two, how deep that would be, number three, how salty it would be, is to drill wells to test. Now, so what you're saying is that based on this, I know, for example, you had the uh, Unwenet Basin, is it, in, uh, in Egypt, southwest? Oh, very Egypt. good, yes. Uh, yeah, so that was one example. Where that you was a one example, a very similar area, similar in, in shape, similar in size, identical in location as far as the desert area is and where we had uh, wells drilled. And now there are 500 wells serving a lot of territory and the proven water resources in that East Unwenet is are capable of supporting agriculture over 150,000 acres for 100 years, mm. meaning a lot of water. Okay, I, I want to ask you an email question that uh, came in from Cairo, actually from Egypt, where uh, Judy Stewart wrote in saying, is the water brackish? I have visited several oases in Egypt and observed the problems caused by brackish water. Would these wells require reverse osmosis treatments before the water can be used for irrigation? This is a very fine question. It's a technical question. Indeed, it can be. We believe that it will not be brackish for two reasons. First, the uh, water in Sharq al Wainat, which is very close to it in this East Wainat uh, region, is not salty at all. It is very tasty, it comes out very sweet. It is less salty than the Nile water. It has only 200 parts per million of salts, which is very small. And the fact that the rocks underneath that location are sandstone, meaning that it would not have much salt. If, if it was limestone, right. the probability of salts would be larger than when it is uh, sandstone. Now you said 150,000 acres irrigated for 100 years. 
on the on the scale of things, on the scale of the country and the, the population and the demands of the people there in Darfur and in Sudan, is that significant? It doesn't sound like a lot. No, it sounds like a huge amount because the water that they get now is from very shallow wells in tiny amounts. For instance, even in the uh, capital of northern Darfur, water is filled in, in uh, tanks only twice a week. So there will be some days where you don't have water or very little or the water that you stored in the pots and pans. So that I if you have water all the time for everybody, this is huge. Of course, the 100 years is great, but 150,000 acres on this, on this, can you compare the size of the country? Uh, in terms of drawing it out over that period of time, will it meet the demands? Do you see that as real potential? Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the water that we speak about from the East Oinat, the ones that you mentioned, is in a very small area where they started. The rest of the lake is 30 to 40 times larger than that. Well, let's, let's find out how you would do it then. So where do you get the money? Who will, who will support you with this? First, the United Nations uh, mission in Sudan, you can call it UNIMIS, mm -hmm. is, has to drill wells for, this, uh, for, the, for its own troops. They, and they uh, intend to send 26,000 people, and these people have to drink. And they told me when I went to Sudan that right now, the best option is to transport water in bottles by aircraft, by, in the air by air. And they said they don't not, not enough aircraft, there are not enough airports, so they have to find water for these people. Especially considering the consumption they're probably used to. <laughs> As you know that these kinds of soldiers will use a lot more water than the locals. They may want to take showers every day or whatever, so this is very different. There would be a lot of use of water. So we have to find water for these people that are not desert dwellers, that who, kn who do not know how to live in a desert and, and be very careful with water use. And so that they have money and they will do that. Second, Egypt uh, came to the table right away and said we are going to drill 20 wells at our own cost from our own, uh, based on our own experience, and they will do that instantly. But you have the issue of security, and this is something I mentioned right at the beginning of the show. The safety and security in, a con in places like Darfur is, is, is a huge uh, issue. How will you get around that? Indeed, and that was the fear at the very beginning when the United Nations people asked me to go to... Uh, to Khartoum and talk to them, and I did, and they said, well, you want, we want you and your people to come over here and go, and that. I, w I was scared myself to say, what, where am I going to go? There, is, there are people fighting and shooting and burning and whatever, and that's, uh, that's what we see in the news every day. So I uh, thought that we'll talk to the government of Sudan to see whether the government is agreeable to this initiative, and, th and therefore the government will make sure that there are these people that will be drilling wells are protected and so on, and indeed is the case. Now, isn't there a danger? Interestingly enough, because of uh, water shortage, it's a commodity that, that you may get fighting starting, fresh fighting starting because of the water. Uh, some control. people said that, as a matter of fact. Some people mm -hmm. said if you have more water, then people will fight over that water. But uh, I found it differently. Uh, that, that, uh, a case like this was in Oman, where w two tribes were fighting over very limited supply of water, and we were asked by the government of Oman to look for potential water resources. And the people from the water ministry told me, listen, in the area such and such, you should start with that because there's a huge thing, mess. And we found a great deal of water in a reasonably large area, and that immediately cooled off the problem between them, and they split the resource. Now, what, what uh, in terms of um, that, that particular area that you're looking at, um, how soon could you get water out of the ground? How quickly could it uh, could Yes, not overnight. That's a very good question, too, because by the, by the time you get the drilling equipment, it will take several months. By the time you drill the wells, it will take several months. By the time to make the wells, the water that comes out of the well available to the people, another several months. So it is really, it, m it must be at least half a year before the people of Darfur see the result. Who controls that, that patch of land where the lake is? It's part of the, go the government of Sudan, and it is ruled by the governor of Darfur. And the government's behind the, uh, the, the President yes. Bashir is, is on board with this. Yes, and the governor of Darfur himself told me that from the beginning, when they first heard of this uh, news, it has actually changed faces of people in Darfur. He, he said publicly that I have seen smiles on the faces of Darfur for the first time in years. Now, of course, as happens with the, the world of science, and you know this, as soon as you write an article, as soon as you suggest something, the critics and the skeptics will come out and, and, and poo-poo what you say. So those who are saying this is nothing new, this is something that, uh, that's already been out there, that you're not actually saying anything new, how do you address those critics? That is okay. That's in, in scientific jargon, this is perfectly normal. We, we do that all the time to each other, which is fine. It doesn't bother me at all. And uh, what the one thing that they were referring to mostly, and these are the especially the te technical people in Sudan, is the fact that the whole of the Eastern Sahara is has a substrate which is called the Nubian sandstone, mm -hmm. and that's loaded with groundwater, but it is very deep. When it may be a kilometer deep, 
I'm not talking about these. I'm really talking about an area, a small area, also sandstone that's under that lake. So it is, that, is, that is very common in, uh, in scientific dialogue. It doesn't bother me at all. And then the people that said, well, there may be no water in it at all. Right. That doesn't bother me either because I never said I am absolutely certain there is water. There are really, when you find this, you say the probability is high. Okay. And the, you, cannot you cannot actually say I am 100% sure that there is water or uh, how, de how deep the water is or how saline it is until you drill it. Well, let's get a call in from the UK. And uh, Dr. Haddad, your question, please, sir. Well, my name is uh, Dr. Raja Haddad. Actually, I'm phoning from Britain. Greeting to you and to your guests. Thank you. Actually, I invented a new technology which to um, uh, disinfect water without using chemicals with very low energy. And uh, actually, we are also using solar energy to uh, purify and disinfect the water. Okay. And has been used successfully, and I got award here in Kent, you know. So yeah. if your guests would like, you know, to contact me, I can. You know, we can uh, utilize this technology for so their interest. Okay, Dr. Haddad, well, I, can I suggest you send me an email at riz at aljazeera.net and we'll get that email across to Dr. Elbaz. Uh, there, you have an offer already of someone to purify any water that might, That's you might very find good. there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haddad. Let me ask you then uh, about the, um, the issue of, uh, first of all, so you have, the, you have to get out there and drill it. You have to find the stuff first, mm -hmm. and then you have to sort out the security aspect of it. When you, when you say that the probability is high, how much did you find that your experience with NASA was uh, useful in you know your your time on Apollo missions. The, the experience you got there was uh, how useful was it in, in getting this kind of project going and the and the, the probability of water there. Well, actually, this this was this is a basic question, and midway through the Apollo program, we had started something called the AAP, the Apollo Applications Program. How do we apply the things we learn from exploring the moon to exploring the Earth? And the f one of the first things was Landsat, how to take pictures digitally. Uh, from spacecraft going around the, the Earth, take the pictures in, in different uh, wavelengths, and then how do you interpret these? So whatever we did with the lunar case is certainly ap applicable here, and the selection of well sites in, the, in Darfur is not really very different from selection of landing sites on the moon because you take a whole bunch of different things and related, relate them to each other based on your interpretation of satellite images. Now, but has, um, because we, we see as ordinary people, we can access satellite images ourselves on yes. the internet. Uh, how much has the technology improved to allow you to, to make a much more accurate prediction? Very much so. The, there are two things that uh, the normal person with the, uh, in the internet doesn't have. These are the radar images, because they're expensive. Each mm. shot, which is a postcard coverage, is three thousand dollars and that is the just to th th that's the information that we use to penetrate through the sand and reveal the underlying topography and then the other one is the radar topography mission which is very involved in the processing and the algorithms and the mathematics of how do you utilize it so there are two components that are not available to everybody there is one component with landsat images that are available for everybody on the go on google so assuming you've got the technology and you're ready to go uh, well you were actually in dc having meetings about this uh, the situation here in darfur as well what what came out of your meetings while you were here in dc well this was our uh, congressman from uh, boston who was just interested in the uh, discussion because he held all kinds of uh, hearings and he wanted to know what the story is to so explain to him with the satellite images what we what we found and what we said, so it's just he would, so he, it will be a bit of information that he would know. Now th we had an email that came in from Pennsylvania, uh, from the United States, and uh, Lon Defender for says, if there is even a slight chance of its existence, it's worth the expense, risk, and effort to reach it. It is almost impossible to address political and religious differences until people are no longer dying of thirst and starvation. And I know in in the longer part of the email that Lou had said how that you know there may be conflicts there, but it's the security of uh, thirst and starvation first that applies. What what danger is there that you raise the expectations and you go out there and you drill and there is nothing and you know that a lot of people are banking on this. The uh, very good thing that came out of that is that I've been contacted with all kinds of people, groups and NGOs and so on, that th I, they, they who cannot drill in the lake region, they need to drill wells right near where the people are. Mm. And they ask for uh, help in selecting sites. People like uh, NGOs that just drill little wells uh, about 200 feet down and with hand pumps and things like that. And, and then next was the uh, doctors, uh, doctors Without Borders, and a very nice humanitarian group of uh, medical doctors that go and help people there. Yeah. 
they w also want us to drill uh, to uh, select uh, well sites for them so and even if there was no lake no water and the lake region which is far from where people live about a hundred miles away right. the people that the uh, groups and the uh, uh, organizations that want to drill wells near where the people are we're going to help them anyway you using the same technology that is one of the problems isn't it that the, the well is in the north part of darfur yes. and of course the people that made the conflict is in the south yes about 150 meters and in real life if you find a great deal of water you can pipe it in a mm -hmm. in a pipeline that's three feet across or something that no, be no, no big deal now what's the next step for you then dr Albaz? it is the uh, selection of well sites and we're now talking with the united nations people the egyptian government and people from the ngos as well as the uh, uh, doctors without borders where we are going to see what are the uh, urgent needs mm -hmm. and we get our data from these three sources from satellite images work on them to satisfy the urgent need for ni ir urgent need first and then begin to plan what do we do about the the lake well do keep us updated we thank you very much for coming in and talking thank with you us. thank you very Dr. Frugal Bas, thank you and thank you for being with us. On tomorrow's show, we'll talk to former supermodel and best-selling author Waris Diri about her ongoing campaign against female genital mutilation. Don't forget, if you have any thoughts about that or pressing issues around the world, send your emails to riz at aljazeera.net. We'll see you next time. Street Talk's coming up next.